What's up, what's up, y'all? Back at it once again, a Coast Kid Fun Day. Kicking this knowledge here for you and for yours. Um, the channel been expanding, much love to that. You know what I'm saying? I gotta give a shout out to my ancestors who make all this stuff possible for me to do these things. And um, this one is in the series about kind of reductive blacks. And this one, we're gonna take a look at Bear Rustin. You know, many people been, we've kind of been a fool to hoodwink and bamboos about Bear Rustin, about the man and stuff like that. Even though he don't get much credit in my circles, you know what I'm saying? In the African national circles I roll with. I just did it for the whole park to make sure that everybody see that he was when we thought he were. You know what I'm saying? This came out November 22nd, 2017. Bear Rustin, while being investigated by the FBI, was being investigated by the FBI while unbeknownst to the Bureau, he was working for the CIA. Bureau files on Rustin's work in the Dominican Republic catching the hearing contradiction of the committed pacifist support for American imperialism. Bear Rustin was many things. He was a key organization organizer of the 1963 March on Washington, an advocate for Soviet jewelry and a convicted homosexual, according to this Federal Bureau of Investigation file. Despite of being well considered a textbook lefty, Rustin also moonlighted for the Central Intelligence Agency. While that might seem irreconcilable, contradiction for a man who sat in prison for two years because he refused to serve in World War II, contradictions aren't there to be reconciled, they're there to be to confound. But first, a little background. By the early 60s, according to part of a Church Commission report, now on the sidebar, we got a um, series on the Church Commission, it's on this page, check it out. Church Commission did, did a lot of underhanded stuff. The CIA decided that their pet dictator in the Dominican Republic, President Rafael Trujillo, had officially become more trouble than what he was worth. Trujillo came into power in the Dominican Republic in 1930. For most of his tenure, the U.S. government supported him. He was guided through much throughout the Caribbean and in Latin America as a protege of the United States. Trujillo rule, always harsh and dictatorial, became an arbitrary during the 1950s. As a result, the United States image was increasingly tarnished in the eyes of many Latin Americans. An increasing, an increasing American awareness of Trujillo's brutality and fear that would lead to a castle type revolution caused the United States officials to consider his various plans to hasten his abdication or his downfall. So he shook, Raphael Trujillo shook up with these people and was doing their bidding, but when they did too much, they didn't need him no more, they said, get rid of him. Trujillo was notoriously violent, particularly towards his political rivals and Haitian residents of DR, which still goes on today. You go to the Dominican Republic, they still treat the Haitian residents there god awful. Anybody that's dark skinned, really, god awfully. Terrible. And so, fearing unwanted attention for their role in propping him up, in 1961, the agency assisted in Trujillo's assassination. The following Trujillo assassination. Juan Bosch was selected, only be subsequently overthrown in the 1963 crew that was supported by, surprise, the CIA, who feared his government could turn communist. President Bosch understand that his, the security of his regime depends ultimately upon U.S. support, particularly as a restraint from the Dominican military, and that his tolerance of communist activities is a sensitive issue. At the same time, his nationalistic, egotistic, and astutely aware of political expedient of appearing to be a U.S. puppet. Consequently, he is not readily amenable to U.S. advice regarding his policy with respect to communist activities. Although he may accommodate to U.S. demands in incidentally matters, he is not likely to prescribe all communist activities useless unless until convinced that they are direct and immediate threat to his regime. President Lyndon Main Johnson, in what be quickly becoming something of a signature move, then got on TV and lied about the American embassy being under siege. With this non-existent threat to American lives, having been established in a false pretense of foreign invasion, LBJ sent Marines into DR on April 28, 1965, where they eventually stayed in order to do over the election of June, 19, June 1st, 1966. According to the files, 
Russ's first travel on DR on behalf of the agency in April 1966 to help determine whether an election would be possible, i.e. favorable to U.S. interests. The following reference in the file captioned domestic is set out information pertaining to his members, including Baird Rustin, of the so-called Thomas Mission, who went to Santo Domingo on 4 for a five-day visit. The purpose of the mission was to determine whether it was possible to hold free election in a scheduled election for 616 in the Dominican Republic. Arranging for the representative of Norman Thomas, a perennial Socialist Party candidate for President of the United States, while in the Dominican Republic, Ben Rustin toured the countryside and was in contact with various officials of that government. Rustin returned to the U.S. in the later part of April 16, 1966. Rustin returned to Santo Domingo in late May 1866 to observe the election of 616, of June 6, 166. Despite being a DR for the work of the agency, the FBI surveilled him. Seemingly to indicate they want so privy to his role in the election. Prior to Russian departure, the Bureau held a belief by a source that leaked the passport reservation information to them that Rustin was headed to Israel. On April 21st, 1966, records of the Passport Office of the United States Department of the United States State Department, Washington, DC, enclosed that on April 7, 1966, Rustin of 340 West 28th Street, New York, New York, was issued passport number blankety blank to the New York Passport Office. Upon a completing his application, but Burton Rustin furnished the following. He was born March 17, 1912 in Pennsylvania, and he planned to depart for New York City via air June 1, 1966, for a four to six week business trip to Israel. He wasn't. It was learned from redacted at LR Israel Airlines that Rustin does not have a reservation for any period during June 66. It explained, however, that he could be part of a tour which prevented his name from appearing on a Pacific flight. This was found to be the case with TWA as well. While Rustin's decision to work on behalf of the government, he long protested in such beautiful ongoing enterprises was shocking to those who knew him. It became somewhat less shocking when the position on Vietnam became known among his compatriots. Blank advised on 10 14 66, Henry Winston contacted Blank at his home in NYC. They discussed by Bernard Rustin's and other civil rights issues, civil rights. Blank commented on a statement that did not reflect the true feeling of the Negro people concerning Vietnam. Blank stated he could not understand. How a great big super pacifist like Bear Russin could sign his name to a statement that upheld Negroes participating in the war. So Bear Russin was for the war against, you know, in Vietnam. You know, despite Russin's support on issues that seemed completely out of tune with the political stance he took as a younger man, he remained advised to Martin Luther King until his assassination in 1968. Continued to work for civil rights, the cause of civil rights afterwards. Rustin was smart as they come, a magistration, and entirely possible that his pacifism and his tolerance of war marking was ultimately one and the same, and each was a tool to further his strategy for the power to bring about change. Mm. You know, so, but let's go a little bit more deeper than that. Okay, now here you go. You see a picture of Bear Rustin, March 17, 1912, you know. August 24th, 1987. All right. All this stuff like this. He worked with A. Philip Randolph on the March on Washington movement in 1941. You know, did his thing with King, as we know about. After the passage, Philip A. Randolph, he came and headed up um, AFLCO. Now, we know the unions and the CIA had a big connection. You know, that's a fact. And AFCO's A. a. Philip Randolph Institute. But look at what I say about the AFLCO. They had a big CIA connection. You know, big on stopping communists and all type of stuff like that. Where they could proceed to be communists. You know, so we know he was gay. Now, this is part that many people don't talk about right here. We're going to get into a little bit more. Later in life, Rustin shifted ideologically towards neoconservative, which President Ronald Reagan presumably praised him after his death in 87. 
So while he was going through, you know, so while the AIDS movement was going on and stuff like that, he, he wasn't really down for the, you know, even for the, the rainbow cause either like that. You're going to find out some, You know, so he's training nonviolent techniques. You know, he met with the president of Ghana and Nigeria. He later supported the community to support South African resistance. Then he got caught in, you know, Pasadena, California in 1953. You know, see, have him doing his thing. We know the march on Washington. So we know about these things. Despite King, the NACP did not work and rush to receive any credit for the role, which he didn't get. The New York Skinny Bulls code my side, the school boycott. You know. Prior to the rest of the, the boycott, the organizer asked the Federation of Teachers Executive Board to join the boycott or asked the teachers to join the picket line. The union declined, promising only to protect from any, protection from any reprisals of those teachers who participated. More than 400,000 New Yorkers participated in a one-day, February 3rd, 1946 boycott. The historian Daniel Perstein noted that the papers were astounded by the numbers of blacks and Puerto Rican parents and children who boycotted in the absence of complete and complete absence of violence or disorder in the street. It was rushed to say that it was the largest civil rights demonstration in African American history. Russell said in a movement to integrate schools will create far reaching benefits for teachers as well as students. The process to demand a complete integration with the city schools will require some whites to attend schools in black neighborhoods. It was challenging the coalition between African Americans and white liberals. The showing white backlash affected relations among the black leaders. Right that it was not right to black labor leaders, Rustin denounced Clemenson for seeking the conduct of another boycott in the spring and soon abandoned the coalition. Rustin organized on March on, March on May 18th, which called for the maximum possible integration per the scene account. The goal was achieved through such minor programs such as construction of larger schools and the replacement of junior high schools with middle schools. The UTF and other white moderates endorsed the rally, yet only 4,000 protesters showed up and the Board of Education was no more responsive to the record story made demonstration than the early confrontational boycott. So it didn't go nowhere, basically. When Russell was invited to speak at University of Virginia in 1964, school administrators showed abandonment of fear that he would organize a school boycott there. The flagship state university and local schools were still segregated. Mm. By spring of 1964, Martin Luther King, so it didn't work out, the little boycott. In spring of 1964, Martin Luther King was considering to hire Russian as executive director of the ACLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but was advised against it by Stanley Leviston, a longtime friend of Rustin. He opposed the hire because he did not consider Rustin growing devotion to the political theories of Max Sackerman and Simonides, as described as a coach's group of anti hiring communist position and attachments to the Democratic Party and the ALC alone. The unions. In 1964, the Democratic Convention allowed the Freedom Summer in Mississippi and Russ became advisor of the Freedom Mississippi Democratic Party where they tried to end Jim Crow. Let's see what happened next. Let's see what happened. Democratic leaders Lyndon Johnson and Henry Humphrey and Hubert Humphreys offer only two non-voting seats to the MEFP as an official seat is going to the regular segregation of Mississippi delegation. Rustin followed a line set by Statman and the AFL CFO leaders urged the MFPD to take their offer. MFPD leaders, including Fannie Lou Hamer and Bob Moses, angrily rejected the agreement and many of their supporters became highly suspicious of Rustin and Rustin attempted to compromise the appeal to the Democratic leadership. So Fannie Lou Hamer, and this right here, when they tried to do, when he formed his party, the Freedom Mississippi Democratic Party, the party of Fannie Lou Hamer, as they said, Bear Rustin, who was working with the unions, the AFCLO, CIO, you know what I'm saying, tried to get the people to say, yeah, take that deal, take the two seats. And Fannie Lou Hamer said, no, we're not going to take that. You know what I'm saying? Which led to another big boycott. You know, so 
Many families said, no, we're not going to take that. Angry rejected the arrangement, and many of his supporters became highly suspicious of Rustin. Rustin's attempts to compromise appeal to the Democratic Party leadership. Mm. So that's, that's another issue right there he tried to do. Rustin believed the African American community needed to change its political strategy, building and strengthening a political alliance with predominantly white unions and organ or other organizations such as synagogues and churches in order to pursue a common economic agenda. Mm. He wrote that it was from time to move from protest to politics. Rustin's analysis of the economic problem in the black community was widely influential. He also argued that African American community was threatened by the appeal of identity politics, particularly the rise of black power. He thought this position was a fantasy of the middle class blacks that repeated the political and moral errors of previous black nationalists, while alienating white allies needed by African American community. The nation's editor, Harvard Law Professor Randall Kennedy, noted later that while Rustin had a very disdain for nationalism, right? He had, a, excuse me, he had a general disdain for nationalism, black nationalism. He had a very different attitude towards Jewish nationalism and was unfathomably a supporter of Zionism. So Bear Rustin is telling black his own people not to become black nationalists, not to become black Zionists. But when it came to the Jews, he supported Jewish nationalism or Jewish Zionism unequivocally. The commentator and editor, Norm Port, had commissioned an article from Rustin. The two men remain intellectual and properly in line for the next 20 years. Podhorts, in his magazine, promoted the non-conservative movement, which had implications for the civil rights initiative, as well as economic aspects of society. In 1985, Rustin publicly praised Podhorts for refusing to pander to minority groups and opposing affirmative action quotas in hiring, as well as black studies programs in colleges. So Baird Rustin just turned straight up all the way Cornish. You know what I'm saying? No more black studies in schools, none of that stuff. No more, you know, he snapped out. Because these are positions, Russell was considered as a cello by many of his former colleagues in the civil rights movement, especially those connected to the grassroots. They charged he was lured in by material comfort that came from a less radical and more professional type of activism. While his biographer, John DeLemo, rejected these characterizations, Randall Kennedy wrote in a 2003 article that the description of Russell was a brought man and at least partly true. So he was already brought and paid for. Here's his work with the unions again. No. The stuff he did, like I said, the unions, no. If you look at during this time, the unions and the CIA was doing their thing together, so which also back up the CIA connection of them. All right, let's foreign policy. Like many communists, like many liberals, oh... Like many liberals and socialists, Rustin supported President LBJ's containment policy against communists, while criticizing the specific conduct of this policy, in particular the matter of independent labor unions and political opposition in Vietnam. Rustin gave others critical support to the United and others gave critical support to U.S. military mentioned in Vietnam, while calling for a negotiated peace treaty and democratic elections. Rustin criticized the specific conduct of the war, though. For instance, in a fundraising letter sent to the War Resistance League supporters in 1964, Rustin being angered and humiliated by the kind of war being raged, a war of torture, a war with civilians and machine guns from the air, in which Americans dropped napalm bombs on bombing on villages. Along with Alan Lowstein and, and Norman Thomas, Rustin worked for the CIA-sponsored Committee of Free Elections of the Democratic Republic, which we already talked about which lent international credibility to the 1966 ballot effectively read against socialist former president Juan Bosch. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Rustin worked as a human rights and election monitor for Freedom House. So if he was working for the CIA then and he just kept on doing it, Freedom House is part of the CIA too. It's an NGO. Look it up. In 1970, Rustin called for the U.S. to send military jets to fight against the Arab states by Israel. Referring to the New York Times article he authored, 
Russian approach Prime Minister Goldemir. I hope that this ad will have also an effect on the serious domestic question, namely the relations between Jewish and the Negro communities in America. Russell was concerned about the unity between the two groups, and he argued faced discrimination in America and abroad. He also believed that Israel's democratic ideals were proof that justice and equality would have prevailed in the Arab territories despite of the atrocities of war. Mm. His former colleagues in the peace movement considered this to be a profound portrayal of Bud Rustin's nonviolent ideas. Rustin maintained his strongly anti-Soviet and anti-communist views later in life, especially in regard to Africa. Rustin co-wrote George Gershman, a former director of Socialist Democrats of America, and future Ronald Reagan appointee, mm, an essay entitled Africa and Soviet Imperialism, the Retreat of American Power, in which he decried Russian and Cuban involvement in the Angola War and defended military intervention on behalf of apartheid South Africa on behalf of the National Liberation Front of Angola. So he now bear Russian his Roman people that goes that's for the apartheid in South Africa. I mean, this kind of man y'all want to celebrate? This is a Wikipedia. And totally on the Unita. And if the South African forces did intervene, urging the black leaders on the side of the force, that's clearly represents the black majority in Angola. To encounter a non-African army of Cubans ten times his size by what standards of his political judgment is this immoral. Russian accused the Soviet Union of a classic imperialist agenda in Africa in pursuit of economic resources and vital sea lanes and called on the counter-administration hypocritical for claiming that it has been committed on the warfare for all blacks doing while doing little to throw the Russian and Cuban expansion throughout Africa. In 1976, Russell helped the Committee of President Danger. Paul Nitz, the leader of the CIA Team B project. <laughs> this guy got a lot of stuff down with the CIA. CPD promoted Team B's controversial intelligence claims about Russian foreign policy, using them as an argument against arms control agreements such as SALT. This cemented Rustin's leading role in the neoconservative movement. So he's super right. You know what I'm saying? All on the white, you know, on the right nut sack of the white man with a wolf, you know. Soviet Jewry, which is also in. The plight of the Jews in the Soviet Union reminded Barry Russell of the struggle of blacks faced in the United States. Soviet Jews faced many times the same forms of discrimination in employment, education, and housing, while also being prisoners within their own country and denied a chance to emigrate by Soviet authorities. After seeing the injustice that Soviet Jews faced, Russ became a leading voice and an advocate of the movement of Jews from the Soviet Union to Israel. So he can do all this, but he can destroy, you know, he can kill black nationalism and, and back to Africa movements. You know, you gotta watch, you see what I'm saying? This is a counterproductive Negro. He closely worked with Senator Henry Jackson of Washington, who introduced legislation that tied trades with the Soviet Union to the treatment of Jews. That's power right there, baby. In 1966, he chaired a historic ad hoc commission on the rights of Soviet Jews organized under the conference by the status of Soviet Jews and a leading panel of six jurors of commission public tribunal on Jewish life in, in the Soviet Union. Members of the panel include Tila Taylor, the Nuremberg War Trial Prosecutor, and Columbia University Professor of Law, John C. Bennett, President of Union Theological Seminar, Reverend George B. Ford, and Pastor Emeritus of Corpus Christi Church, Samuel Fisherman, representing the auto representing the United Automobile Workers, and Norman Thomas, a veteran socialist leader. Now, Bear Russell done set all this stuff up and he can just get you a march. But when he came out to the Jews, he he set up all this stuff, an ad hoc commission. He he the only black guy on a damn commission. <laughs> and he 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 the historic chair of it. That should tell you something right there. Kind of productive. Let's keep on going. The commission collected testimonies from Soviet Jews and compiled them into a report that was delivered to the UN Secretary General of the United Nations. He urged in the report to the international community to demand that Soviets allow Jews to practice their religion, preserve their culture, and immigrate from the USSR at will. The testimony of the Soviet Jews was published by Moshe Dickert, 
and executive secretary of the Conference of Status of Soviet Jews in his book, Redemption, Jewish Letters of Freedom from Russia, with a forward by Bayed Rustin, saying, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Rustin wrote several articles on the, Soviet, on the subject of Soviet Jewry and appeared in Soviet Jewry movements and rallies, demonstrations and vigils and conferences in the United States and abroad. He co-sponsored a national interreligious task force on Soviet Jewry, allied with the Senator Patrick, Daniel Patrick Monaghan, we know about Daniel Patrick Monaghan, an uh, outspoken advocate for Jewish Soviet Jewry, and closely worked with Senator Henry Jackson to inform Jackson Van Lack Amendment, a vital legislation that restricted so United States trade with the Soviet Union and the relationship with Jews. So he told him go get a nation. He put all these amendments through the UN. You ain't never heard of Bayard Rustin going to the UN for black people. You know what I'm saying? Kind of productive, but you can do it for these people. Really? You can shit move down for them. Oh, right, let's see gay rights. Now you won't be surprised when you come down to gay rights about Bayard Rustin too. He also testified in the New York State gay bill, gay rights bill. In 1986, he gave a speech that the new niggers are gays, you know, or gays and new blacks. He coined that phrase. In which he asserted, today's blacks are no longer the litmus paper or the barometer of social change. Blacks are in every segment of society and there are laws to protect them from racial discrimination. The new niggers are gays. In this sense, gay people are the new barometer for social change. The question of social change should be framed with its most vulnerable group in mind gay people. While there's a recurring tendency to describe Rustin as a pioneering out gay man, the truth is more complex. In 1986, Rustin was invited to contribute to the life in life a gay black uh, a black gay analogy. He declined explaining, I was not involved. Let me read this again. In 1986, Rustin was invited to contribute to a book in the life a black gay anthology. He declined, explaining, I was not involved in the struggle for gay rights as a youth. I did not come out the closet voluntarily. Circumstances forced me out. While I have no problem with being publicly identified as a homosexual, it would be dishonest of me to present myself as one who is in the forefront of the struggle for gay rights. I fundamentally consider sexual orientation to be a private matter. As such, it has not been a factor which has greatly influenced my role as an activist. So he was not for gay people like that and gay rights and stuff and did not influence his role as an activist. He said, it. this is his words verbatim. Rustin did not engage in gay rights for activism until 1980, into the 1980s. He was urged to do so by his partner, Willie Nagel, who's still alive. You know what I'm saying? And that's how the stuff got on through. Due to lack of marriage equality at the time, Rustin and his power, Walter Nagel, took an unconventional step to solidify their partnership and protect their unification. In 1982, Rustin adopted Nagel, 30 years old at the time, to legalize their union. That's crazy. So Rustin adopted this cat to legalize their union. And that's what it is. So this guy right here, Barry Rustin, was a counterproductive black. You know what I'm saying? He told you, his own people, to be nonviolent, nonviolent, you know, and march and do all this orderly stuff. But when it came down to the Soviet Jewry and the Jews over there, he told them to blow them away. He's being perpetrated as a fraud, as a, such a called gay rights activist. And we read in his own words, he says so himself, that as such, has not been greatly influenced my role to become an activist. His gay rights, he, he, he wasn't a gay rights nothing. You know what I'm saying? He thought it was a private matter. He did coin the term, though, you know, gay is a new black. He said the new niggas are gays, but gay is a new black. He did coin that term. But we got to look at this guy for the, in the whole scope of him. He working for the CIA, destroying people, you know what I'm saying, lies on that, on that tip. Stopping stuff about blacks and trying to get stuff on an international level done. But when it came out to the Jews, he got it done for them. So we got to look at this guy for what he is. Uh, the counterproductive black that's being promoted. A CIA agent of fraud throughout the black community. A man who didn't even care about his own people. He is truly, truly 
And Connor bring out your flag. All right, now check me out on the next time. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Peace.